this is me, this is Jane. Greetings. Every single one of us makes an impact on the planet every single day, and we can choose what sort of impact we make. Because of the help I had from the chimpanzees, because they're so like us, science gradually was forced to admit that we humans are not the only beings with personalities, minds and emotions. So what we have to knock down is this idea that short-term profit is more important than the future generations of this planet. Telling stories is the way to go, not confrontation, not aggression. Telling stories hope people change from their hearts. 60 years of research on wild chimpanzees and decades of commitment to animal welfare and environmental protection. My guest today is the world-famous British ethologist Dr. Jane Goodall. She needs little introduction. I suppose most of you are at least somewhat familiar with her work, but uh, let me just say a few words anyway. Of course, originally she has been best known for her long-term studies of wild chimpanzees in Tanzania, especially in the 1960s. During that time, she discovered that wild chimpanzees are able to use tools and to even make tools. And that was a discovery that completely redefined how we as humans perceive animals and that really transformed the relationship between humans and animals. Today, of course, her legacy goes even far beyond that. She is the founder of the Jane Goodall Institute and a United Nations Messenger of Peace. And just in general, at least, at least as far as I'm concerned, probably one of the most inspiring personalities out there. We have recorded this conversation for the German podcast show Weltwach and its international version Unfolding Maps. So if you are into podcasts at all, please make sure to check them out as well. Dr. Goodall and me, we talk about her research in Tanzania and the beginnings of her involvement as an activist. She also explains why she's not afraid to even collaborate with uh, supposed opponents to get things done. And she reveals why she still hasn't lost hope despite the massive challenges that we as humans face on our planet. Please enjoy our conversation. Dr. Goodall, welcome to our show. I'm really thrilled to have you. And I'm very happy to be invited. Thank you. <laughs> and I would like to jump right into it, if you don't mind. Let's into, jump right in. <laughs> into one of the most important periods of your life, which was, of course, taking its beginning at the age of 26, when you found yourself in a place that would become really formative for you and for your career. You went to the Gombe Stream National Park in Tanzania, which is one of the smallest national parks in that country. It, um, yeah, with it, it's the smallest. It's very, very small, about 35 square kilometers. With which intention did you go there back then? What, what did you expect you would be doing there? Well, I first went out to Africa because I dreamed about it ever since I was 10 years old. I wanted to go to Africa, live with wild animals and write books about them. So when I first went, I went to Kenya when I was 23, and I met the late Dr. Lewis Leakey, and he was a paleontologist, but he'd been looking for years for somebody to study chimpanzees because they're our closest relatives, and he thought it might throw light on how maybe Stone Age man behaved. So mm -hmm. he decided that I was the person he'd been looking for. He sent me off to Gombe. Nobody had studied wild chimpanzees. And, of course, all I had to go on was the fact that all my life I'd been watching the animals around my home. And so I, what I expected was eventually the chimpanzees would win my... I would win their trust. But as I went along Lake Tanganyika and looked up at the forested slopes of the Gombe National Park, I remember thinking, how will I find the chimpanzees? And But it took it took a while, and at first they ran away as soon as they saw me. <laughs> yeah, and I also remember reading that it was even quite a challenge not only to find the chimpanzees, but to actually get to the national park because of violent conflicts that had erupted nearby. Yeah, that's right. On the other side of the lake, the Democratic Republic of Congo, yeah. as it is now, it was Zaire back then, and the people had 
revolted against the Belgian mm. colonialists, and the Belgians were arriving in Kigoma in great distress, some of them without any, you know, belongings. And so that was when it happened that I got to Kigoma, the nearest town, and there were all these refugees. No way was I allowed to go to Gombe. So <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, quite a quite a strange beginning. Yeah, an incredible journey that you took back then. Was it at all common? I mean, you mentioned that nobody had stand studied uh, chimpanzees up to this point, the way you intended to do it. But was it at all common for women to work in these challenging environments back then and also specifically in primatology? Well, it wasn't common for women or men. I mean, mm. at that time, there were three people only who yeah. were out in the field studying primates. Mm -hmm. One was the man doing gorillas, and then there were two Americans in South Africa studying chakma baboons. And that was it. I mean, there was no protocol, nothing for me to follow, just my own feeling. There was no protocol, and there wasn't even any uh, college training that you could use, like theoretical, deep knowledge uh, that you would have gained in a, in a, in a formal, in the traditional sense. What, no, what... when I left school, I should have gone to university, but we didn't have enough money, we didn't have much yeah. money. And so, actually, Dr. Leakey particularly was delighted that I had not been to college because yes. he believed the way that the scientists were thinking about animals back then was very reductionist, and he was absolutely right, absolutely right. So also he felt that women might be more patient, make mm -hmm. better observers. So being a woman and having not been to college, amazingly, both were to my advantage. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh... Was that like his um, opinion of the situation? Was that also what gave you the confidence to believe that you were in fact the right person for the task? I just knew it. I mean, that was my dream since I was 10 years old when mm. I fell in love with Tarzan. And so, you know, I knew I was just waiting for this opportunity. And it was yeah. amazing that not just any animal, But the one most like us, the chimpanzee, you know, we share 98.6% of our DNA with them. So uh, how incredible. And nobody knew anything about them in the wild. Nothing. Mm. Yeah, so you really went out into some open spaces on the map in that sense. And uh, you already mentioned that it wasn't all that easy to even find the chimpanzees in the beginning. Uh, so when you found them, how did you start to approach them and to observe them? Well, what I had to do, because for for over, well, for nearly six months, most of them ran away as soon as they saw me. So what I did was to find out where trees were with ripe fruit, mm -hmm. and I would get there early in the morning and sit and wait and hope the chimpanzees would come. I never tried to get too close, and if I saw them, I would sit down with my binoculars and watch them from a distance. I wore the same colored clothes every day. And, you know, I knew that with time I could gain their trust. But it was only money for six months. And this was the big worry. Will I have the time? Hmm. Or will I let Louis Leakey down and end my dream? And I believe uh, one chimpanzee that uh, kind of made sure that that didn't happen was um, David Greybeard. Yes, which... David Greybeard. And, <laughs> you know, every chimpanzee has his or her own personality. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, David Greybeard was less afraid of humans in general. I mean, he sometimes was seen down near the lake shore, um, near the fishermen's huts, because the fishermen camped there in the summer. And... So right from the start, although to begin with, he disappeared when I arrived, but gradually he began to get used to me and I could get a little bit closer to him. Mm -hmm. And then came the magic day when I saw a chimp, I didn't know who it was, sitting on a termite mound. So I quickly stopped, got my binoculars focused, and I saw a black hand reach out and pick a grass stem. And I could tell this grass stem was being poked into a hole in the termite mound and pulled out with termites hanging on. And 
the chimp was eating. Then he turned sideways so I could see much better. And it was David Greybeard, of course. And not only was he picking and using grasses, but he picked leafy twigs. And to use them as a tool, he had to remove the leaves. So that was modifying and thus making a tool. Mm. And this was magic because at that time, science thought that only humans used and made tools. So it was that observation that enabled Leakey to go to the National Geographic Society and they agreed, A, that they would send money so I could carry on after the six months, and B, a photographer, cameraman, which was Hugo van Lauwek, Dutchman, mm -hmm. uh, to record what I was gradually now beginning to learn more and more about chimps. When you observed um, David Graybeard using these tools and making them, I suppose you immediately understood the significance of that observation. Well, actually, when I first saw it, I didn't quite believe it. Uh -huh. um, Maybe to be an honest, accident, coincidence? It, well, no, I just thought, well, can this really be happening? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I didn't even send a telegram to Leakey until I'd seen it again. And then it was David and his best friend Goliath, two of them. And then, you know, gradually I saw more. But um, it was when I sent this telegram to Leakey, He wrote back, sent another telegram. We, you know, there was no email or <laughs> anything yeah. like that in those days. And he said, now we shall have to redefine man, redefine tool, or accept chimps as humans, because we were defined as man, the tool maker. <laughs> so he, he understood the significance for sure. He um, did. Yes. But you know, the thing is, although I knew it was very exciting for that reason, I wasn't surprised. Hmm. Because there's a wonderful, I think he was Austrian, um, and he'd written a book called The Mentality of Apes. And he had a little colony of chimpanzees on the Canary Islands for some reason, I don't know why. And that book I had read, and it showed how intelligent chimpanzees are. But the ridiculous thing is other scientists said, Well, that's because they're captive and they've learned all this from their association with humans. I mean, that's how stupid the scientists were back then. Wolfgang and, Kohler um, was his name. <laughs> Wolfgang Kohler. Okay. Um, that's how stupid the scientists were, but you also ended up having to deal quite a bit with these scientists because yes. as impressed as Louis Leakey, your scientific superior, was with your research and your findings, your observations, He also told you that probably now it was about time to actually finally get a degree. So after two years in Tanzania, he suggested, and I think you followed his suggestion, uh, you went back to Cambridge, you actually did a PhD, and in some ways you had a pretty rude awakening. <laughs> Is that right? Well, it wasn't my idea to get the degree. Leakey said he yeah. wouldn't always be around to get money for me. I would need to stand on my own feet mm -hmm. and I would need a degree. And there was no time for an undergraduate degree. So he put me bunk into a PhD program. I was the eighth person in the history of Cambridge to sit for a PhD without a primary degree. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, when I got there, I was nervous. You can imagine, I hadn't been to college. Now here I am at the most prestigious university, one of the two in, in England. And to be told by so many of the professors that I'd done everything wrong, giving the chimpanzees names, David Greybeard, Mike, Goliath, Flo, Figgen, that wasn't scientific. I should have numbered them. And how could I dare to talk about chimpanzees having personalities or minds or emotions, those were unique to us. But fortunately, when I was a child, I had a wonderful teacher and he taught me in this respect, these professors were absolutely wrong. And that teacher was my dog, Rusty. <laughs> and so, of course, the chimpanzees... Because you knew based on your dog that Animals can have a personality. Yes, and I mean, it was yeah. so obvious with the chimpanzees. Yeah. It was so obvious from the book, The Mentality of Apes. I mean, I don't think the scientists believed what they were saying, but they didn't know how to treat personality, mind, or emotion in a scientific way. Now we do. Now you can study it. You can get degrees in all of those things. But back then, I couldn't have 
done a degree in, in personality, animal personality. It didn't exist. <laughs> so, But, okay, you had your dog, you had your experience and your opinions and your knowledge. But what I find really impressive is the confidence, the self-confidence you must have had back then to not be totally disheartened by their verdicts and basically filled with self-doubt, but actually to reject their common wisdoms. And I call it self-confidence. I could imagine that back then these um, scientists, they would have called it maybe arrogance. <laughs> no, no, they would never have called it arrogance. Okay, that's good. I didn't confront them. Mm -hmm. I didn't stand up against them and say, I'm right. Mm -hmm. I just very quietly went on using those words when I was writing up my mm -hmm. thesis. Okay. And I was really lucky. I had one of the top three ethologists in Europe, top four, sorry, as my supervisor. And there was, you know, Conrad Lorenz and Tim Bergen from Holland, and then two in Britain, Thorpe and Hind. And I had Robert Hind as my supervisor, and he was very critical of me. But then he came out to Gombe, and he wrote to me afterwards. He said, in those two weeks, Jane, I've learned more about animal behavior than all the rest of my life. And so he then helped me to write about what I knew to be true in such a way that I couldn't be torn to pieces by scientific critics. And it, it was, he taught me how to think in a scientific, logical way, which I loved to do. But I, I had arguments with him in those days, and even today, to be a good scientist, you must be objective. You cannot have empathy with your subject. And it's the empathy that I felt with the chimpanzees that sometimes enabled me to, to watch a, a strange interaction and think, well, I'm pretty sure they're behaving like that because of this. And then you stand back from your intuition. And then you can put on your scientific hat and say, well, is my intuition right? And it, it's, you know, it's, it, yeah, this kind it of all empathy, worked. I think, helped you, for example, to observe behaviors like humor, which otherwise you would have just brushed off, maybe. But because you <laughs> took your intuition and your empathy, you were actually able to interpret these behaviors uh, much more correctly in the end. Yes, absolutely. Mm. Because, you know, if they share 98.6% of, of their DNA with us, And, you know, they kiss, embrace, hold hands, pat one another. Their behavior is so like us. They do those things in the same context that we do. And it was shocking to find they have a dark, aggressive, brutal side. They're capable of a kind of warfare. But they also can show love, compassion, and true altruism. So, you know, they have the two sides of human nature, the dark side and the good side. And... So, of course, they have personalities and minds and emotions. Yeah. So you started as an observer to then become a scientist and a researcher with obviously an absolute passion for your subjects, uh, a passion that is very uh, obvious to this day. And you then progressed even further throughout the years, especially in the 80s, to what you are known for today, besides your science, of course, which is a worldwide activist for conservation and environmental issues. And uh, you resisted stepping into the spotlight this way for quite some time, I know, um, because you much rather wanted to continue to focus on your science. But eventually you decided to commit to advocating for nature, for the chimpanzees in particular, uh, on a much larger level, and thus to potentially also make some enemies along the way. And I'd like to talk about some strategies to communicate these urgent issues of uh, conservation um, mm -hmm. to communicate them but to also actually get things done which can be <laughs> a difference here and there so a big topic nowadays is um, you surely have heard the term a uh, cancel culture and uh, I believe you started to feel some of that um, already some decades ago. We we talked earlier about you giving names to the chimpanzees um, something that was completely unusual back then. And uh, years later, you violated some norms again because you collaborated with oil companies, you sat down with labs that were doing scientific tests on chimpanzees. 
and you worked with them. And uh, there was some criticism, some lack of understanding about that. How do you think about and how do you make your decisions about who to associate with, who to collaborate with, and who not to, to, to actually get things done? Okay, well, first of all, I want to correct you on one thing. Please. I did not make a decision to leave mm -hmm. the Gombe forest that I loved. Mm -hmm. I went to this conference where we brought together the people who by then, it's 1986, and by then there were six other chimp study sites in Africa. We brought these people together for the first time. We had a session on conservation, which was shocking, and we had a session on conditions in some captive situations. Mm -hmm. So I went to that conference as a scientist, happy to go on being out there. I really think of myself as a naturalist, but anyway, that was my life. Mm -hmm. I left that conference as an activist. I knew I had to do something. I didn't make the decision. It was somehow made. There was a change. And so I didn't know what to do. And one of the first things I wanted to see if I could do anything for the chimps in medical research, because the conditions, there's our closest relatives with their lives in the wild, and now I'm seeing them in five foot by five foot cages by themselves, these very social beings, sometimes 20, 30 years. Why were they there? Because their bodies are so like ours that scientists thought, Well, we can use them as guinea pigs to do find new vaccines and cures for diseases. Refusing to admit the equally striking psychological and behavioral similarities. So, anyhow, I knew that although I dreaded it, I had to actually go into one of the labs to see with my own eyes. Because I don't think you can talk about something meaningfully unless you have some first-hand experience. It was a terrible day. I'll never forget it. And going into that lab and seeing this with my own eyes. And at the end of it, I came out. My eyes were all teary. And it was a National Institute of Health lab. So all the top researchers from NIH in America were sitting around a table waiting for me. And I sat down waiting for somebody to say something, and they were all looking at me. And I, I didn't know what to say. And I, So what came into my head was, uh, well, I'm sure that all caring, compassionate people will feel like I do, having seen those conditions. And I'm sure you're all caring, compassionate people. But they couldn't say they weren't, could they? Mm. So this led to a series of meetings with those people in the labs. I didn't confront them. I didn't point fingers at them and tell them what they were doing was shocking. I showed them film of the Gombe chimps. I told stories about the Gombe chimps, like an adolescent male adopting a little orphan and saving his life. And it, gradually they began to change. But because I met with them, a lot of the animal rights people refused to speak to me. They said, how can you sit down at a table and drink a cup of coffee with these awful people? I said, if you don't talk to people, how can you ever expect change? So it's been a long, long fight, but at least at the beginning, the first thing that I managed to accomplish in several of the labs was to give the chimpanzees something to do, because think of the boredom. Think of a mind that's very active, a very social creature, and you're alone in this cage, and the only interactions you have are with humans who come and stick needles into you. And so I was able to send into one of the biggest of the labs a young man who'd had experience in zoos, and he introduced what we call environment enrichment, giving them something to do, giving them toys, changing the toys, giving them puzzles to get their food instead of just dumping it, giving them variety, not just monkey chow, but apples and things that made them excited. So at least it was a little tiny bit of light shining in this dark space. And, you know, finally, all 400 National Institute of Health chimps are out in sanctuaries. 
So, but and it wasn't just in the U.S. I went into labs in Holland, in the Netherlands, um, in Austria. There was a terrible lab in Austria, and mm. uh, those chimps are out in labs, um, out in sanctuaries as well now in Budapest. So you managed to um, influence how these labs worked and to make changes because you really, yeah, you said down with these people, you told them stories and you provided them with emotion and information that maybe they didn't have before. Um, and uh, that was a strategy or a tactic or just an intuition that you followed intuition. pretty early on. Intuition. From, yes. Because I But, think if you want change, people must change from within. Hmm. I mean, they can pay lip service to change and do nothing. But if inside themselves they feel what we're doing is wrong, then then you see the change that you've been striving for. What I struggle with in that sense is if we talk about um, some of the big challenges that confront us and our planet, um, such as climate change and the mass extinction of species. These developments have been well known and documented for a long time. There is no lack of information. There is no lack of shocking imagery. And yet we so far have not taken a decisive enough action anyway to, to counteract these developments. Do you ever feel that perhaps uh, it's simply somehow against our nature to think beyond really our own self-interest to a sufficient extent anyway and to think of whole generations that will come after us and to, to a certain extent put our self-interest aside for them? It's Do you ever struggle nature. with that? Yeah, it's part of our nature. You know, chimpanzees will squabble over food and try and get as much as they can for themselves. But really what's gone wrong is this gradual move towards materialism. And you get the, the powerful people, the CEOs of big multinationals, the um, presidents, prime ministers of some countries, and they are putting short-term gain ahead of thinking about the future, the health of the planet, and future generations. And this is the big problem. But on the positive side, there is far more awareness now among ordinary people. There's consumer pressure on some mm. of the big corporations. You're behaving in an unethical way. I will not buy your products while you behave this way. That's beginning to make a difference. Plus. Uh, because we have a youth program that we'll talk about later, but young people, once they know the problems, you know, they start influencing their parents, and their grandparents, some of whom are these high-up decision-makers. And as I travel, as I, before the pandemic, I was traveling 300 days a year around the world, and I was meeting so many amazing people restoring fertility and nature to overused land, to destroyed land. I was seeing projects that brought forests back where it had been desert. And strangely, the silver lining of this terrible pandemic that we're still struggling with is that we brought it upon ourselves by our disrespect of animals and the natural world. And it's pretty positive that this pandemic began because of the terrible conditions in a wildlife market in China. And these wildlife markets are across Asia, they're in Latin America, <clears throat> they're in Africa, creating conditions that make it possible for a virus to jump from an animal to a person. And as people begin to realize this, more and more people are working towards How do we develop a better relationship with the natural world and at the same time maintain decent standards of living? So what we have to knock down is this idea that short-term profit is more important than the future generations of this planet. Yeah, you mentioned um, trying to create an appreciation for nature or trying to basically go beyond the disrespect of the natural environment. Um, that is one of the big challenges of our day and age in these years and this uh, century of globalization, digitalization, megacities. 
a time in which many people feel probably rather detached from the natural world in their own life. Some of them don't really ever experience nature and animals. And I think to change that is at least one of the reasons that you, in fact, started a program some years ago in 1992 that uh, by today has turned into something pretty amazing and pretty big, um, which is the Roots and Shoots program. Yeah. Um, what is that program about and what is uh, today's scope of that program? Okay, well, actually, it began in 91. Oh, 91, <laughs> Whole yes. year earlier. Oh, actually, it uh, also we, says 91 in my notes here, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's, And so okay. we celebrated mm -hmm. the 30th anniversary this year. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, it began because as I was traveling around the world, I was meeting young people who'd lost hope. They said, you compromised our future. There's nothing we can do about it. And we have. There's no question. We've not only... Um, compromised their future. We'd been stealing it for years and years and years. And when they said to me, you compromised our future and there's nothing we can do about it. Yes, we've compromised your future. It's not true. There is something you can do about it. So it began with 12 high school students in Tanzania who were discouraged, who saw all the problems around them, environmental and social. And I told them to find their friends who were also concerned, and we had a big meeting. And that's when Roots and Shoots was born, February 1991. I can see it now. Mm -hmm. And we decided that the main message would be every single one of us makes an impact on the planet every single day, and we can choose what sort of impact we make. Secondly, that because in the rainforest I learned how everything was interconnected, that each group of Roots and Shoots, young people, would choose three projects, one to help people, one to help animals, one to help the environment. They would choose it themselves so that they could roll up their sleeves, take action, and do something they were passionate about. So from that small beginning, it's now spread to 86 countries, and it's growing fast. We've just recently started amazing programs in India, in Turkey and Israel. Uh, it's got thousands, thousands of groups around the world. We've got members in kindergarten. We've got members in university, everything in between. Even some adult groups now, like the staff of a big corporation who kind of act as watchdogs. And... CEOs who welcome this, and I can't begin to tell you, but even as you and I are speaking now, there are kids in different parts of the world actually taking action. It's kind of been slowed down by the pandemic because kids can't get together, or young people can't get together, but making use of the, of the um, internet, making use of the ways that we can communicate now like you and I are communicating, which is what's happened to me. I've become virtual Jane now. <laughs> the, the, you know, the upside of that is in the same time as I would have been traveling around the world by sitting here at home, and this is the house I grew up in, by the way, mm -hmm. sitting here, I've reached literally millions, millions more people in many more countries than I possibly could have while I was traveling. But Roots and Shoots is my main reason for hope, because when young people understand, when we listen to them, when we empower them to take action, they are changing the world. And that is a beautiful thing to point out, because, um, I mean, you're, you're saying this is your main reason for hope. And in fact, most of your books and films have the word hope in their title in some way. And I believe uh, some people who maybe are not as familiar with your work and they are pretty worried about how things are going on our planet, they might feel because the challenges we face are so big, so difficult to tackle, so abstract in some sense, that hope is almost in some sense a little bit naive um, today to have hope. But what you did with that program and what that program um, is doing today and which kind of impact it has, it shows that... Well, if you just talk about, I don't know, getting together a lot of politicians and making 
one big decision on one big conference and then hope that will turn things around. Of course, that's maybe a, a little bit difficult and hard to have this kind of hope. But if you focus your hope and on what you, your friends, your family, and a lot of people who think like you can do on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and if you look at what people like you are doing and accomplishing by following that spirit, then hope suddenly, um, at least to me, doesn't seem quite as naive anymore. Yeah, that's right. And that's, that's precisely what's happening. If you look yeah. around at the whole big picture, you're depressed. And I, I don't know if you have this expression, but I keep hearing... Think globally, but act locally. But it's the wrong way around. Mm -hmm. Because if you think globally, then you're depressed. But if you say, well, here I am. What can I do? Me? Nothing. But wait a minute. Maybe I can. You get together with a group of your friends and you decide that you'll clear up the litter along a beach and you see it's beautiful and clean. Or you decide plant trees, and this is happening all over the world now, planting trees, um, you think, I can go and volunteer in an animal shelter. Um, I can raise money for refugees. And when you and your friends get together and take this action, then, as I say, they are changing the world. It's the taking action and seeing the result of your action. And as you say, knowing other people are doing the same thing, then you have hope. So to get hope, take action. But you need hope before you take action. Because if you don't have hope that what you do is going to make a difference, why bother to do it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. Um, of course, you try to meet with many of these young or middle-aged people, whatever they are, that participate in Roots and Shoots or in other programs to talk to them, to tell them, your story to inspire and encourage them. And uh, there is, in fact, a very cute scene in the 2020 documentary, Jane Goodall, The Hope. Yeah. Um, I hope I remember it uh, correctly, but I believe there is a boy reading a letter that he wrote to Mother Nature, quote unquote. And he says that for him, in some sense, you are <laughs> Mother yeah. Nature, yes. which is just a beautiful scene. And it shows which kind of impact you have. And As far as I can say, of course, I don't know you personally, but it seems like you have remained a pretty down-to-earth and very humble person. So my question is, how does it feel for you to be an inspiration to so many people and to even by some be called something like an icon? Well, it feels very peculiar, especially now I'm at home. I mean, this is where I grew up. I'm mm -hmm. with my sister. We were children together. Uh, I never planned to become what I've become. It's not my, not my doing, it's just happened. And at first I was, you know, basically a very shy person. And when people would come up to me in the street and say, could you sign this? Or uh, one person actually said, can I touch you? And I, oh, my God. Um, at first, you know, I wanted to wear dark glasses and let my hair down. But I suddenly thought, this I must make use of. This is here for a purpose, and I must make use of it. So I talk to these people when they come up. I always have little brochures about Roots and Shoots or the Jane Goodall <laughs> Institute. It's helped to grow. And the number of people, young people who are now older people, who said, Jane, I want to thank you. One, you taught me because you did it. I can do it too. But secondly... Joining Roots and Shoots has totally changed my life because I realize there is hope and I promise you I'll do my bit. And so many, many, many people. So I just have to accept this kind of weird, iconic status, which I don't understand. I simply don't because I'm still just the same me that grew up here, the books, Dr. Doolittle and Tarzan, that I dreamed of when I was a child, the tree out in the garden that I used to spend hours up, it, up in the branches to be closer to the birds. And I'm still the same person. You're still the same person, but you look back to an amazing amount of unique experiences from the early observations that we talked about to your advocacy to actually seeing the impact that you have made materialize throughout the decades. What are you 
most proud of yourself? Uh, what would you like to be remembered, uh, let's say, 50 years from now? Well, <clears throat> two things. One, because of the help I had from the chimpanzees, because they're so like us, science gradually was forced to admit that we humans are not the only beings with personalities, minds, and emotions. And that, although it's too slow, but it is gradually leading to more and more movements all around the world where we need to better respect animals and understand they are sentient. They feel fear, they feel happiness, they feel pain. And that is spreading. Mm -hmm. It's kind of building up steam right now, but anyway, it's spreading. And as I say, I hope the pandemic helps because we've just got to treat wild animals differently and factory farms and a hotbed of breeding these new diseases, zoonotic they're called, and they jump from an animal. So to, to have left behind when I die a movement that is increasingly respecting animals and treating them with more compassion, that's one. Uh, I thank the chimpanzees and I thank my dog, Rusty. And, of course, I always thank my mother for everything. She supported my dreams as a child. But um, secondly, the next thing I hope to be and will be remembered for is starting Roots and Shoots because that's changing the world. And as I say, it's growing all the time. It's all over Germany. 2,000 or more groups across China spreading fast in India, and you try to bring young people together from different cultures and religions and countries and economic status so that they begin to understand far more important than my culture, the color of my skin, is the fact that we're all human beings. We talked about how you were able to change minds, to create new empathy for animals in particular, for the natural environment. And um, if you don't mind, I would like to conclude with one specific story that illustrates how you have been able to do that, even in pretty spontaneous uh, situations, which were not um, incorporated into big strategies or conferences or routes and shoots, but actually took place in a taxi journey with a taxi driver in London in a pretty unexpected way. Um, you uh, have told that anecdote uh, before. Maybe you remember it still. Yeah, um, I remember would it you very mind, well. Yeah. Would you mind I, uh, telling it? to just to have? <laughs> yeah. It's uh, just a small but really beautiful example of how you can make change even in your day-to-day -day life. Yes, which I try to do every day, by the way. But anyway, um, I got into this taxi to go to the airport. And I was pretty tired. And it was early in the morning. And I was thinking, I just, you know, relax. This taxi driver knew who I was. <clears throat> somebody told him and he started on at me straight away you're like my sister she just spends all her spare time helping animals in the shelter and oh, there's all these starving children and you've no right to be considering animals before you consider people and he went on and on so when I could get a word in I explained that we were helping people that we had many programs in Africa to help women and children and help people get better livelihoods. Then it still made, didn't make any difference. So then I told him stories about the chimpanzees, some of the, you know, wonderful moving stories where they help each other and so on. And anyhow, I talked all the way to the airport. It was about 20 <laughs> Even minutes. Even though you, you were so tired, you just yeah. wanted to sleep. But, but okay, I, yeah. I sat for all <laughs> of that little jump seat in a London taxi cab. <laughs> and when we got there, He didn't have any change, and I didn't have any change. So in the end, uh, he actually owed me, I think it was 10 pounds, which was worth more then than it is now. Mm. And so I said, well, give that, give that money you owe me to your sister for her work. And I didn't think any more of it. I mean, there's no way he's going to do that. When I got back after three weeks, there was a letter from his sister saying, first of all, I want to thank you for your donation. Secondly, what did you do to my brother? He's been three times to help me. He's changed. How did you do it? <laughs> That's incredible. So I think the message there is you may not ever know 
the result of what you've been doing. I mean, it was just pure fluke that his sister wrote to me. Mm -hmm. And so it's always worth, if you see an opportunity, it's worth telling stories. And telling stories is the way to go. Not confrontation, not aggression. Telling stories, hope people change from their hearts. One of the many things people love about you <laughs> is that you never lost your sense of youthful humor, as far mm -hmm. as I can tell. For example, mm -hmm. uh, you tend to start your presentations and speeches with a traditional <coughs> chimpanzee greeting. Um, would you mind? And I know that's uh, a bit daring to ask of you. So if you don't want to, that's absolutely fine. Would you mind instead to finish off this uh, conversation with a chimpanzee farewell? Does that exist as well? No, it will actually be a greeting to everybody who's listening. They don't say goodbye. They just walk okay. away. So I won't mm -hmm. do that. I will send out a greeting to thank people for listening. And um, every chimpanzee has his or her own voice. You can tell who's calling. Helps them keep contact with each other. But my pant hoot, it's called a pant hoot, because it's all one breath. <laughs> This is me. This is Jane. Greetings. <laughs> And that is the perfect ending for this episode, I believe. Jane, Dr. Goodall, I should say. <laughs> Jane is fine. Thank Jane is fine. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you, Jane. Thank you so much for making the time and for having this conversation. Thank you. I appreciate it. Well, I've enjoyed talking to you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.